I just want to welcome, I'm Ruth Ann Hinson. I'm Director of Statewide Outreach Services at Maryland School for the Blind. Um, I just want to welcome everyone to Chris's third webinar in his series of four. This one is CBI Intervention Approaches and Strategies by Phase. Chris's uh, fourth and last BOO webinar is going to be on February 17th, and it is on CBI and Communication Adaptations. Um, and then we will have one more uh, presentation in April as part of this webinar series. And this will be from Diane Sheline um, conducting. Well, let me just say Diane and I had talked, if we're still pretty much all virtual, it will be on conducting an informal CBI range assessment virtually during the 2021 school year. If for some reason and miracle, and hopefully we are all back in person, she will be doing a different topic, but that's what our plan is right now. Um, so I wanna introduce Chris and then we're gonna give out um, for those who need the ACVREP opening code. Oh, actually, let me do that now. The opening code is um, inter intervention. So one more time, the opening ACVREP code is intervention. Um, I'm going to introduce Chris, um, and then we're going to do a real quick poll to just ask you what field you are from, um, just to help us get some data and see where most people are coming from. So let me introduce Chris real Chris, I mean, if you've been in the webinars before, you've heard this before, but um, for those who haven't, um, Chris Russell is the project coordinator for the New York Deaf Blind Collaborative and has experience as a classroom teacher and teacher of the visually impaired. Chris specializes in severe and multiple disabilities, including deaf blindness, cortical visual impairment, curriculum adaptations for children with visual impairments and additional disabilities, and instructional strategies supporting communication development for children with pre-symbolic communication. He has the Perkins Roman CVI range endorsement and conducts training in CVI characteristics, phases, assessment, and intervention across New York State and nationally for professionals and families. And maybe that will become international, Chris. He also serves as co-instructor for Perkins eLearning online course, Cortical Visual Impairment and its adjunct facility or faculty, I'm sorry, at Hunter College, C-U-N-Y, in the graduate programs for blindness, visual impairment and childhood special education, severe multiple disabilities. So welcome again, Chris, very thrilled to have you. So I'm gonna let Conchita Go ahead and post the poll, the opening poll real quick. Right, and just to let you know, I posted the webinar information in the chat and I'm gonna post um, both the February and the other date, um, the link there for everybody in case you don't have it. Okay, so the poll, all right. Um, so the first question, um, it should now be up on your screen is, are you from Maryland, yes or no? And the second question is, what is your role? And you can do multiple choice on that one. So TVI, o &M, administrator, parent, or other. So it looks like it's still going. Thank you all so much. It looks like more than 80% are from outside of Maryland as we saw so many international people as well. Perfect, give it just a tiny bit more because I see people are still typing. Um, we have other, a big other category about 29%, 30% now. Mentor for new TVI, oh, that's really great. Yeah, and if that's you put great. other in the, um, in your poll, if you wanna put what that is in the chat, that would be great. All righty, thank you all so much. Um, I'm just gonna share the results really quick. So y'all should be seeing them now, majority outside of Maryland and um, TVI is 67%, um, but we do have other at 29%, O&M at 19, administrator 1% um, and parent 3%. All right. Oh, and just real quick, because um, I know people have been asking, the previous sessions have been uploaded to the MSB YouTube channel so if you subscribe to that, you should be able to access them and then you'll get links to the future recordings when they are posted. Perfect. And I will put the link to, um, so that you all can subscribe to the YouTube channel. All right. I think that's all the business that we need to take care of. So we're going to hand it over to Chris now. Great. Thank you.
you so much. Um, great to see you all here in the attendees uh, list and in the chat box, of course. I just want to say thank you so much again to Ruth Ann um, for inviting me to present this webinar series with you. I'm so glad that we could make it a four part series so we could really dig a little bit deeper into the content. Um, as you'll see today, if you, you probably saw if you were on the last few sessions, there's always too much for each individual topic to even get an hour and a half on. But um, at least we can sort of scratch the surface. And my hope is that I can provide you with some ideas and uh, a strong framework for understanding considerations in each of these areas um, as they relate to best practices and what we know works for a broad and diverse group of students who have CVI. Um, before I, I'm just going to set up, share my screen. Before I share my PowerPoint, I just wanted to share this with you, um, and I'm going to put the link in the chat box right now as well. After our last session on assessment, um, Charlotte Cushman, and hi Charlotte, I know you're here too, um, reached out to me from Paths to Literacy and asked if we could create a post based on the example that I gave about assessment of 3D complexity of the array. Um, and I really just appreciate your time and collaboration with that as well. Um, and I'm really happy that we put this together because it's a fairly, I hope, straightforward but pretty comprehensive overview of what I talked about in particular with assessment of complexity of the array. Um, all of the best practice considerations for that, um, some links to other resources and tools that you may find helpful, as well as um, photos and, you know, actual sequence steps walking you through the example that I gave of um, a sequence for assessment of complexity of 3D array with uh, increasing the complexity of the array of objects themselves, as well as increasing the array of the background complexity. Um, and even, you know, forced me to update some of my photos and take pictures of new things, which is always great. There's also some additional sort of frequently asked questions there and some links to other things. Um, if you, if I didn't share it with you last time, um, I think I at least mentioned it last time, but Charlotte also helped me to um, put together this post, which provides that template for functional vision assessment that I shared with you last time as well. It's a pretty comprehensive template for um, writing your functional vision assessment report for a student with CVI based on the CVI range. The link is in the chat box for that as well. So um, if you found those useful, hopefully you can um, you know, share them with colleagues, feel free to make use of them. And um, um, as always, I really don't, I don't need you, know, you to necessarily credit me for anything in particular, just feel to run with the materials and examples that I give you and uh, make them your own and use them and adapt them with your students and children. So um, just gonna get this set up now. I have the chat box open and just my only piece of housekeeping is that I will just keep talking. Um, I have way more content to share with you than we possibly ever have time to share it. So um, I'll just keep you know ranting away but um, if you have anything that you'd like to interrupt me with, please, I really welcome that. I wanna make this as interactive as possible. Um, I always appreciate your questions. Um, I also always appreciate examples of what, what's worked for you with students or your own children, or of course, anything that I can help clarify. I also definitely appreciate if you have other tools and resources that have worked for you about anything in particular that we're talking about, please just feel free to share those in the chat box. I'm going to keep my eye on the chat box and refer to it as we go. So, um, you know, please do interrupt me. Um, okay, so just a little bit of quick sort of review. If you weren't here for the previous sessions, we talked first about uh, characteristics and phases in session one. And in session two, we talked about CVI range assessment and functional vision assessment practices, including writing up reports for functional vision assessment. All of this is based on the specific approach developed by Dr. Christine Roman Lancy. And it's important to really emphasize that this is the approach that qualifies cortical visual impairment as being a condition that, that, is, that, that consists of unique visual behaviors and specifically these 10 unique visual characteristics 
that are manifest across three phases of severity. So we can spend a little bit of brief time reviewing that. I think we're gonna, you know, we're gonna hear a little bit of repetition um, in terms of understanding phases, but I'm going to apply that in this session to intervention practices rather than to just observation and then to the second part assessment. Um, once again, just credit where credit is due. All of the work that I'm sharing with you is based on my collaboration with uh, wonderful professionals across different roles, speech providers, teacher of deaf, hard of hearing, uh, teacher of visual impairment, as well as with parents and classroom teachers. Um, and I would be remiss to leave out the collaboration with paraprofessionals and teacher assistants that has been really critical to me as well. So um, credit to them. Um, this is the CVI fact sheet, which also um, is posted on Path to Literacy, so that we don't have to do a ton of review. I'm just going to skip the sort of overview of CVI stuff so that we can get right into the content. But a lot of the overview of CVI stuff is right here for you in this two-page fact sheet that I developed over the last few years, along with a lot of resources and answers to frequently asked questions. Um, we're not going to do a review of the CVI characteristics. I'm just going to go quickly through the slide so we can, you know, keep our eye on it and remember what those 10 characteristics are. Color preferences, need for movement, visual latency or difficulty with visual latency, visual processing delays, visual field preferences. Remember, not losses, but preferences. Oh, and thank you. Charlotte put the fact sheet into the um, chat box. Difficulty with visual complexity, which is four different types of visual complexity, complexity of the object, complexity of the array, as well as complexity of faces and multi-sensory complexity. And we're going to address these when we talk about intervention by phases. But just a reminder, um, need for light, which we used to call um, light gazing or non-purposeful gaze, we're now calling need for or attraction to light, because it's a much more um, sort of comprehensive um, way of, of talking about how this characteristic is expressed along the entire range of students, not just for those students who are in phase one or phase two. Difficulty with distance viewing, which overlaps significantly with complexity and really is the same thing as complexity. Um, atypical visual reflexes, difficulty with visual novelty, and difficulty with visually guided reach. Um, and we can talk about this a little bit more in terms of intervention, but I want to again make the point that children who have motoric challenges and cannot physically achieve visually guided reach can still be assessed in this characteristic. And um, that's my mental reminder to myself that Charlotte and I are going to also develop a post around that and explaining what visually guided reach and assessment of visually guided reach might look like for students who have motoric challenges and cannot physically achieve um, reach independently. Um, so look out for that. Phases of CVI, just to review. Phases uh, describe the severity of CVI or the severity of the impact of CVI in three phases. Phase one is roughly zero to three. Phase two is roughly three to seven. And phase three is roughly seven to 10. And CVI phase is determined by assessment using the CVI range specifically. Intervention must be guided by phase. And we're going to really understand what that means today, um, not just theoretically, but very practically. I'm going to give you a lot of examples of how intervention looks very different depending on what phase the student is in. And in my experience, while it's optimal to have an actual CVI range score, it's absolutely critical that you at least know what phase the child is in um, because your approaches are going to be highly unique to the phase that the student is in. So if you're not yet ready or you don't yet feel totally comfortable with reliably using the CVI range to achieve an actual score, a number on the range, if you can at least get comfortable with estimating the phase that the child is in, um, that's going to be massively helpful to you and you can really start to do the right thing in your intervention practices just by knowing the phase. So everyone on the team really needs to understand what phase the child is in and what intervention looks like by phase, um, which is the goal of today's session. Okay. I always give some sort of like, you know, philosophical disclaimers or overarching approaches to um, the way that we should be thinking about this. 
And in terms of intervention, these are my sort of, you know, first round of disclaimers for today. We're talking about individualized intervention programs. Every single child is completely unique and individual. The approaches that we have are um, broad and describe trends in what we should be doing. But we do need to remember that intervention is completely individualized. Adaptations are individualized. Students' preferences, their likes and dislikes are individualized, as well as their routines, their home and family experiences and preferences. Um, you know, the, um, all of the different things that are going to go into making an individualized educational program for the student. That is similar to CVI. There is no ready-made program for CVI intervention. So um, I can't give you, you know, a list of things to do here. You, you try this and run with it. Instead, what I'm going to give is um, a broad overview of the understanding of what it looks like by phase and then I'll give you examples. So I wanna emphasize that strategies are misleading because you can't just plug them in to any student's intervention plan. Um, and you can search around online and find hundreds of examples of adaptations and strategies. You can go on Pinterest and find a thousand different examples of adaptations that people have made for a student with CVI. Be cautious of that because they really, they may or may not work for your student or your child um, even if they're in the right phase, they might not work for your child or your student. The characteristics are um, impacting students in different ways too. But I think that ideas are useful to generate more ideas. And when I was a classroom teacher and uh, practicing TVI, I found that it was really helpful to get inspiration from looking at what other people were doing and then figure out how to adapt those ideas to my own work with individual student. Um, Yes, could you restate the opening code? I think it's intervention, right? I think so. That's correct. Great, thank you. So that's just my sort of um, you know overview approach, just to remind you that any examples that I give you um, are just examples. Take them and run with them. Do your own things. Um, you know, I know that there are a lot of TVIs attending the session right now, and um, in all of the TVIs that I know, and even in my own experience as a TVI and as a teacher, everyone has various levels to which they are comfortable with, um, you know, the craft element of being a teacher, the, um, the building of things and the adapting of materials. And some teachers are really great at that. Some teachers that doesn't come as naturally to them. I'm not a teacher for whom the craft element came naturally to me, which is, um, Ironic because on the side, I also do illustration and work as an artist, as a visual artist. But um, the, the crafty building of stuff was not something that came naturally to me. And um, I needed inspiration from looking at what other people were doing. And I'm gonna share some resources for you that are helpful for that. And I think that have better quality control than going somewhere like Pinterest or just Googling you know, CVI intervention. So I'll try to give you some resources that are a little bit more um, you know, quality control. The first question you want to ask yourself, as I said before, is what phase is the student in? We really want to be sure to target interventions by phase. Um, and targeting an intervention in the wrong phase is going to mean either under adapting, over adapting, um, and either way, it's, it's not going to be meaningful for the student. So think about the phase, think about the impact of each characteristic as we talked about before, and how does this impact the child's use of vision in activities, right? This is what you should get in the results of a functional vision assessment. Probably the number one purpose of a functional vision assessment is understanding the impact of the child's unique visual impairment and all of their other characteristics and their preferences and their, their routines and their, um, you know, their concept development, all of these things, but especially the specific unique impact of their visual impairment and the severity of it on their use of vision in practical activities. And that's why um, for me, 90% of, probably 90% of functional vision assessment is observation because observation gives you what's relevant and what's actually functional. Whereas direct assessment gives you a controlled situation that doesn't really represent the child's real life and their real experience and activities. So I wanna know what the child's doing with and without adaptations in natural environments. Um, 
When you know that, you can start the process of planning interventions. And of course, best practice is really for that to be done in um, a thorough, comprehensive assessment. So take any activity and think based on the child's phase and characteristics, can the child use their vision in this activity? It may be no. The answer for a child in phase one is often going to be no. Uh, the child can't use their vision in this activity. That's okay. Don't force the child to use their vision in that activity. Don't necessarily expect the child's going to use their vision in an activity that is really too complex and involves too, min too much multisensory input for vision to be accessed in that, in that experience. And if that's the case, maximize access to other sensory channels. If the child maybe could use vision if they had just the right adaptation, well, then that's what we want to target in terms of a visual adaptation. And what we're going to see when we go through phases is that that's really the, um, the main practice in phase two, especially. Targeting visual interventions and in specific activities. We teach to each category's phase, correct? Um, what do you mean by category? We're definitely targeting CVI interventions unique to each phase. Oh, each characteristic. Yeah, but um, the, the, the characteristics are all going to be re relatively aligned to the phase. So it's not that a child will be in phase one for color and in phase two for movement. They're all going to align. And what we see in, if you go back to the um, CVI range uh, webinar, the part two, the last one, you'll see that in rating two of the CVI range, you know, the one pager that you're, you're looking at each characteristic and you're rating it on a scale of zero, 0 0.25, 0 0.5, 0 0.75, or one, scale of zero to one, you'll see that they, they more or less align in an actual column you may have some characteristics that are a little bit more impactful and they're gonna have a slightly lower score. Some characteristics that are a little bit less impactful to the child and they're gonna have a little higher score. But they will, um, they will line up in a column. And if they don't, you're probably doing something wrong in your assessment and you should uh, you know, take a second look. The previous sessions are definitely available and Ruth Ann mentioned that you can access them on the Maryland School for the Blind's YouTube channel. So, so take a look. Um, okay, consider as well that that's going to vary by activity, right? Can the child use the vision in that activity? And, and to what extent can the child use vision in a specific activity? It's going to vary um, depending on the activity, especially depending on the levels of multisensory input or multisensory complexity, how much background noise, how much tactile interaction, how much physically strenuous um, input is required. So PT, physical therapy, is probably going to be an activity for most kids with CVI, especially if they have low muscle tone or if they um, you know, have difficulty with, with uh, weight bearing and whatnot, if they have difficulty with their gait. Those are going to be activities that are going to be multisensory, very complex for that child. And the visual uh, access and visual, visual processing skills are going to be be lower in that activity, and that's okay. And I always remind PTs, especially physical therapists and OTs, especially, it your goals are important too for the child. Um, we need to find that balance, right? We need to find the balance of um, to what extent can the child be using their vision in PT? And the answer may be well, maybe just a little bit at the very beginning of the session to kind of visually explore the materials and the environment that um, that that are going to be used. And then during the activity, which is physically strenuous, it's multi-sensory complex, it's okay if the child's not looking at anything. But we want to be deliberate about that and plan it. We're also talking about the extent to which an activity or an environment is familiar or novel. And again, more novel environments and more novel materials is going to mean lower visual expectations. And that's okay. But we need to be thoughtful in planning it throughout the day and figuring out what those levels are. Okay, so let's get right into it. The um, plan for the day, and we have another hour, so I feel like we can get through a good amount. Again, um, I'll try to save a little bit of time for questions at the end, but in general, I think questions work better as we go, um, because otherwise I'll just, you know, otherwise I'll, I'll run out of time, to be honest. So um, we're just going to go through each phase. We're gonna talk about phase one, phase two, phase three, 
And then I do have some slides at the end that dig specifically into literacy practices. We'll see how much we get to that. If we don't get to it, at least they're there for you as a resource. Um, and I try to make those slides as descriptive as possible because you know, knowing that, the, that they're at the end, we may not really get to it. So phase one, intervention. The goal of phase one intervention is building visual behavior. In phase one, most or really all of the CVI characteristics are impacting visual functioning. All 10 of those characteristics have an impact on visual function. For children in phase one, looking is a goal in itself. And what that means is that we're not expecting children in phase one to look and do at the same time. We're expecting that looking is enough of an activity in itself and doing is too hard to to um, engage in looking practices at the same time and doing anything, um, physically interacting, uh, listening, tactily interacting. It's too hard to put those two together, those, you know, those senses, multi-sensory uh, access together. So visual activities in phase one need to be just about looking. It means a high level of environmental control. That doesn't necessarily mean a dark room, but it may, sometimes it may. And I think it's uh, people's go-to assumption to say, you know, a child in phase one needs to be in a dark, quiet pull-out room, just looking at, you know, brightly colored things or flashlights or glow sticks or something like that. That may be helpful for a specific student, but for another student, that may not be exactly what they need. So again, um, take these ideas and figure out how they apply to your individual child based on assessment and based on observation. I want to just be really clear, and I'm going to talk about this at greater length when we talk about um, communication in the next session. Session four is on uh, alternative and augmentative communication. Um, we'll get more into 2D and you know literacy and language development and use of AAC systems in that session. But I do want to make it clear here that children in phase one are not able to visually process 2D materials at all. It's not possible in phase one to be able to um, make sense of or process, which means recognizing, uh, identifying, and discriminating 2D information, including photos, line drawings, uh, print, symbols, anything in 2D, not possible to access in phase one. That doesn't mean don't sh show a child in phase one a book. A child in phase one may still be able to see a book as a 3D object, and they may be able to see the bright color fields on a book. So take, and I'll look into my sort of bag of tricks over here. Take a, you know, a common book, Clifford, right? Look at it's, you know, there's some complexity over here, but you imagine a child in phase one, and I'm holding up this, you know, old torn Clifford book right now, um, bright red dog, a child in phase one may is really not going to recognize what that is, is not going to be able to recognize, identify, or discriminate any of the 2D information here. But they may see a bright red field there, a bright red color field. Um, and if you shine a flashlight on it, they may be able to direct their visual attention towards that bright red color field. They may be able to actually find Clifford on the page in every page of that sequenced book, even in phase one. And that may be a positive literacy experience for a child, for a young child in phase one. Um, you also wanna remember that um, pre-literacy and early literacy experiences are not just about the complex, higher order visual processing skills involved in reading. We still read to um, you know, infants and, and toddlers. Um, we still read to children who do not have expressive language. So I don't wanna limit what you show kids, but I want you to recognize that you, um, you need to be thoughtful about what the visual goals are as well as what the comprehension goals are for those activities. Okay, so maximizing visual access to modalities, but don't expect visual fixation. Um, and I'll give you some examples of that. We still make the adaptations, we still adapt things, um, we don't have to go crazy in our adaptation of activities throughout the day for a child who really can't look and do at the same time. Um, but we're not expecting the child to be, you know, maintaining visual attention or, or even establishing eye to object contact, which it does, really doesn't happen until you get a little further into phase two. And we'll talk about that when we get to phase two. 
So what's that mean? Um, it means also making use of other sensory channels. That could be auditory input. Maybe when we're reading, we're listening. Maybe when we're reading or engaging in any activity, we're also touching and we also are making some tactile adaptations. Um, and I don't mean braille instruction. I mean um, tactile components to materials that otherwise would be looked at visually. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a bit. My biggest recommendation for a child in phase one to make sure that you're really getting the opportunities, giving that child the opportunities that they need in order to make progress and develop their vision over time, their visual functioning over time, is to plan specific times of day for addressing visual goals. And don't let a day go by when you don't spend some decent and significant amount of time scattered through the day, not long periods of time, but time scattered through the day um, to address visual goals. That's how we're gonna make neurological progress. And remember, CVI um, intervention is targeting actually making progress in neurological visual processing, um, which is very different from ocular or eye-related approaches, right? Which are geared towards teaching teaching compensatory skills, teaching a child to learn how to succeed and access materials despite the fact that they have a visual impairment. In CVI, we're literally trying to uh, teach the child how to make sense of what they're seeing and how to eventually actually grow in their, in their neurological processing. How much time per day is the most frequently asked question that I get with phase one. There's no answer to that. Um, I'm not going to give you a, you know, a, a strict mandate of, you know, five times 15 minutes a day, um, five times 30 minutes a day, two times 30 minutes a day. It it's really varies from child to child, but there are some considerations that may be helpful, and that is um, frequent opportunities, um, so several times a day not long periods of time because a child with CVI in phase one is not going to be able to, it's going to be very visually fatiguing and strenuous to um, visually taxing to attend for long periods of time. But at the same time, each child may need a little bit of warm up time before they're actually looking at things. So in a 20 minute period of looking of CVI intervention for phase one, you may, you may take 10 minutes just to warm up, five minutes of actually looking and five minutes to kind of warm down. Um, so, so it really varies from child to child. Um, I think it's important to look at the full schedule of the child's day and think about when might be good times to focus on this visually taxing activity of looking at things. Probably not after lunch, right? Everybody is tired after lunch and wants to take a nap. Um, everybody feels a little bit more drowsy after lunch. So um, that's probably not the best time. Also, probably right after a physically strenuous activity like PT or gym, probably not the best time. Um, you may think of vision as a warm up as well. So it may actually be helpful for a child to increase their, um, you know, their attending and their engagement after a vision session. Really is going to vary from child to child. But it's important to, to plan it and to work with the team to find out what those times might be like. Talk to the team, talk to the entire team, look at the child's full schedule. What are the best times for this? Maybe it's a five, 10 minute session, you know, in a little downtime period. Maybe it's uh, during a transition between activities, there's a little bit of time for vision when the room's a little more quiet um, and, and so on. Think about the different roles of team members that are involved in this and who can actually implement phase one intervention. Is there any opportunity for the PT to implement phase, phase one intervention, maybe as a warm up before the PT activity? And that might actually be helpful for that PT activity. Um, whereas with the TVI, it's kind of obvious with the teacher visually impaired, your whole session is a CVI intervention. And so, you know, really plan that and take the time to establish it and make use of the fact that you actually may have a little bit of a longer time than the rest of the team has to do that. Consider that vision might be a warm up before a non visual activity and make sure that people know that if the child has just done a vision activity. Don't expect much use of vision in that activity that follows it right because the child has really spent their visual battery and um, 
probably just needs to interact and engage by listening and touching instead. Okay, so some concrete ideas for phase one. I like to give the idea, the, the, the example of a lava lamp, not that you should use a lava lamp because they tend to be um, very hot and unsafe, right, for a classroom, but they're kind of a perfect example of what you're looking for in a phase one intervention because they have, they address multiple characteristics, bright light, color, and movement, right? Um, we're thinking about overlapping multiple characteristics. So not just things that have light, not just things that have movement, not just things that have color, but things that really have all three of those and that you could imagine using in a, in a quiet environment too. So, um, you know, those mylar wind tunnels are pretty good. They have a reflective quality, which mimics light, um, obviously movement, and then, you know, bright colors. Um, I just have this image here. It's just an image of a flashlight uh, sort of with a clip attached to a bar. It's actually a bar on a wheelchair. Um, I had an example to remind me that uh, of a good example that I saw of a student that we attached a, I wish I had a photo of it. We attached a flashlight to the, to the bar on the back of his wheelchair or on the back of his Riften chair. And um, he had a switch that he could actually hit to activate the flashlight to illuminate something in front of him. So it's kind of a cool idea that, you know, the child has a little bit more agency and experience or, you know, opportunity to illuminate objects in front of them by a backlit surface that allows them to, um, you know, to, to create that, that illumination. You know, bright, shiny mylar balloons, things like this. Um, these kinds of like, uh, you know, lights, like, like Christmas lights, um, they're good, but I just want to, to sort of bring up that the ones that are individual bulbs are not actually as good. The ones that are kind of those, you know, tubes are much, much better. The individual bulbs create complexity um, that is not actually very helpful, especially if they're multicolored. So if you're going to use these, use more like the wrap around kind of, you know, tubing kind um, and not the ones that kind of are constantly um, lighting up or moving that that can add to the complexity. Okay. Um, this was another example similar to the one I was talking about with the flashlight. This was a cool example of a downtime CVI uh, phase one um, activity. Um, integrating an accessible switch into a self-directed experience for the student's downtime. So this is a little girl um, at a school I've worked with up in Albany. And um, she has a head switch that when she hits, um, turns on a fan that blows air on the golden um, pom-pom that's taped to the wall to her left side in her preferred visual field. So she actually has the agency and the, um, you know, the, she has the ability to activate her own CVI intervention. And I don't mean to say that you should, you know, leave a child to do this for, you know, a half an hour. This is like a five minute, maybe 10 minute downtime activity to do a little visual practice um, at a time when otherwise um, she, she wouldn't be doing anything visual. So um, also note that there is a black board there that's blocking off all the background complexity uh, in front of her. Shelly's asking, where would you get information on how to connect a flashlight to a switch? It, it, was, it was actually like, a, um, it has to be something that you can plug in. It was like a plug-in lamp kind of thing, like a little plug-in um, you know, clip-on lamp. And if you connect that to, a, um, to like a Big Mac switch, or to one of those um, power delay boxes. Um, you can connect, I forget what those are called, the power something, power link. They're called power link um, from AbleNet. Battery interrupter, as Annette is saying. Um, power link is one of the ones that AbleNet sells that you can plug any, um, you know, any device into, anything with, a, with like a standard outlet plug. Um, those are very helpful. Um, so same thing that you would use here. Oh, thank you, Charlotte. Um, and Rachel saying you can connect a jelly bean watch to a power link, plug the lighter fan into. Cool. Yeah, exactly. So those are really um, good and simple uses of assistive technology to sort of create some more um, student driven intervention. So it's not always just you know a teacher dangling something in front of a student, which you know, there's nothing wrong with that, but um, in terms of addressing self-determination on a more holistic level for students and um, building up their own 
uh, sense of cause and effect even, or, uh, or just their participation in the activity actively as opposed to passively uh, participating. But I like that example and it was really helpful for that student. Um, consider the busy classroom. We talked about this a little bit with complexity of array. This is a preschool classroom in Queens and um, uh, this is obviously representative of a pretty busy preschool classroom, right? A shelf with you know, hundreds of different uh, multi-sensory toys on it, a lot for the child to deal with. But if you just go to the other side of the classroom, they've created an actual space that is much more controlled. So I like to tell teachers, like, I don't want you to paint your whole room black and to remove all distractions and all, you know, complexity. Um, I just want you to create a space in any way that you can that is actually a vision space for the, for the student. Hopefully there's one in the classroom, even if it's sort of an adaptable um, setup and, you know, and, and pull down um, for the activity one. Uh, or in addition to, you know, side rooms or pull out spaces where a student can really have more controlled space, but this is the same classroom. Um, so also using, you know, portable and fold up spaces like this, this was the, an, a, an innovative use of one of those trifold boards, putting it behind a student so that when he looked in the mirror, it blocked off the, the background complexity behind him. Um, just be thoughtful about what's in this child's array. So that was a good example. Also, um, sometimes just the act of shining a flashlight on something to illuminate it can make a really big difference as we've talked about at various points. Um, this was an example of, um, this is what I like to show people who say, well, I really don't have space in my classroom to create that kind of a controlled setting. Um, this is in a very busy and very tiny preschool classroom in Queens, um, New York, that there really wasn't any space that they could use. But these are preschool students and they're little. And um, they had gotten one of those little portable sound walls, which you can get from, you know, like Lakeshore or any number of those um, uh, classroom supply catalogs, a little foldable and, um, you know, portable sound wall. And they put a little board on top of it and poked holes in it to hang things from almost creating like a little, almost like a little active learning space, like a little room. Um, and the student and the teacher are actually inside of that space for the vision activity. The sound wall blocks off some of the unnecessary ambient sound in the room. And uh, it also provides a nice contained visual space for the child to look at uh, visual materials. So this was a cool idea and, you know, a great example, I think, of teachers being creative and making use with what they, what they, what they can practically. Um, I just want to emphasize that those sensory rooms, or this was like the busiest one I could find on Google Images, the Snozellan rooms, can be overstimulating. So taking a child into one of these rooms may not be the right answer. This is, there's a lot going on in here unless you can turn off most of the materials and just have one of them up. Um, in one of the hospitals that I work closely with in New York, um, they have a really, really great sensory room with tons of this kind of stuff. But when we take a child who's in phase one into that room, we turn off everything but the one thing that we're looking at. And we make sure that we're really only accessing that room when, when it's empty, when it's the only child in there. So just be aware that, you know, this is also, it may be overkill. I do not think that every single child with CVI needs like the, you know, the three thousand dollars worth of, um, you know, light up equipment and stuff. Um, you can do the same kinds of things with dollar store materials. But if you have access to this, make use of it. It's it's good stuff, especially those. Um, what do you call those? Like dangling light strand things. My vocabulary is not good today. Um, this was a cool example of an app that um, that one of my colleagues here in New York, Jonathan Hooper, um, found, which is called Cause and Effect Sensory Lightbox. And I just want to show you this short little video of this child who was probably in late phase one. Um, and um, I really like how the TVI Jonathan is using this Apple Pencil, basically, helping the student, collaborating with the OT to figure out what the student's grip and grasp goals were. And using this... Um, you know, the Apple Pencil to kind of hold on to. He's using really unintrusive hand use. He's not touching the student at all, which really reduces the multi-sensory complexity. Instead, he's just holding on to the end tip of the pen of the Apple Pencil um, to help guide her use of it. He's also allowing her to look away and look back. 
um, you know, at her own time. So you can see this app allows you to sort of turn your iPad into a light box basically, but it also allows you to choose different colored backgrounds. So just watch this short video and you can kind of pay special attention to when the student is looking and when the student's not looking. Okay, so I think it's a really nice example of very unintrusive hand use, um, allowing for processing time. The name of the app is Cause and Effect Sensory Lightbox. Um, someone just asked the question in the Q and A, um, and it allows for lots of different you know options and sort of templates. Some of them look a lot more complex than others. Um, you can also have it with a sound, but you know, obviously important to turn the sound down for a child who um, is in phase one. Um, also, the positioning here was really deliberate. We're going to talk about positioning a little bit um, soon. Um, and to me, this is just as good, if not better, than you know, some of the many hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars, even um, you know, sensory sensory adaptations and materials. Um, someone's saying you can make a battery interrupter fairly easily. There are videos online. You can do it using a, so a soldering iron or not with equal results. That's pretty cool because those um, power links from AbleNet are rather expensive. So it'd be good to find out a DIY to, way to do that. Um, the child's writing is just an iPad with an Apple pencil, right? So um, the positioning is also very deliberate. Um, just in case you were wondering, the child has a left visual field preference, which you can see pretty clearly there. And the mom had helped him to um, position the student for the activity. It's like a $1.99 app. Um, and there are lots of good examples of these kinds of things. Tactile adaptations, remember I talked about in phase one, um, it may be helpful to add tactile components to any visual components. Just make sure that there are tactile components that also double function as visual components with bright colors, right? So, you know, APH, American Printing House for the Blind, has a lot of these types of tactile materials. Um, the dollar store has them too. Um, you know, the, what do they call that? Like the carousel of tactile materials or something. Um, Wiki sticks. This is the quick, on the bottom right, the quick draw paper from APH is good for early writing activities where we are talking about a child who really should be and is a visual learner, needs some visual interaction with that experience of um, you know, early literacy. Um, so rather than trying to you know, focus on Braille, which really has no visual component, can you focus on a visual component that also has some tactile quality to it? Okay. The quick draw paper is basically that dehydrated sponge paper that when you draw on with a wet marker, it raises up the surface. So just make sure you're drawing on it with a bright saturated color. If you have name cues or tactile cards for um, you know, labeling students cubbies, make sure that they're highly visually unique and that they have feature, they feature bright colors. That's on the bottom left there. Okay. In each um, phase, I just have like a little slide that that lists a handful of examples of accommodations for, for each phase. I'm not going to go through each one of these because I think it's a little bit redundant to what we've already talked about, but I wanted to have it there for you because these are things that you could actually put on the child's IEP under management needs or accommodations, right? So if a child's in phase one, consider getting some of this wording, some of this language on the IEP so that it's really mandated as part of the child's management needs. Okay. Um, I also have suggestions for the role of the TVI in phase one. This is an area that, you know, I, a, there's a lot of different 
um, opinions about this across the field. So this is just sort of my opinion on it. And um, my opinion is that really in, it's not about, you know, pull out or, you know, pull out sessions or push in sessions are, are all bad or all good. And there isn't a strict rule about that. But in general, in phase one, it's probably a good idea to pull the student out into a more controlled environment, whether that is somewhere in the classroom or whether it's a separate room, um, because you really have this unique opportunity in phase one to focus on those visual tasks as a, as a TVI with the student. Um, it's also really important as a TVI to work with the rest of the team to identify what they could be doing at reasonable times and to a reasonable degree. Um, and I really like to emphasize that everyone on the team has an important role. You should never, um, you know, feel like you're telling people that your role and your goals are more important than theirs. Um, it's about finding a balance across the team. So, you know, work with the t work with the PT, work with the speech pathologist, work, work with the OT, and figure out well, what are some little things that they could be doing to replicate some of the bigger goals that you have for the child, um, as opposed to sort of like dictating or mandating. This is what you have to do. You know, to take a half an hour for your activity to do this. Um, instead, work with them to find something that's reasonable in their activity and help them adapt the environment too. Okay, so moving on to phase two, um, I just know that like we never have enough time to get into phase three. Um, I want to spend a lot of time on phase two, but I will at least give a little bit of an overview on phase three intervention. The goal of phase two is to integrate vision and function. Students in phase two are able to use their vision in activities if they have the right adaptations, if they have the right opportunities, if they do not have the right opportunities and adaptations, we see a much lower level of visual functioning. So these are kids who, if you put the right things in place, you will see some targeted looking um, throughout the day. Children in phase two can look and do at the same time, but only if they have the supports in place. And these are, we're not talking about um, consistent and constant um, looking throughout the day. We're looking at targeted points of the day where we expect visual attention, fixation, and use of vision for learning. I also want to note that there's a really big difference between early and late phase two. Remember, we talked about phase two being sort of in three to seven on the range. Very big difference between a three to four and a six to seven. And that difference is roughly the level of visual adaptation that's needed, but it's really about um, emerging eye to object contact. We talked in the first session about the difference between visual regard, visual regard, and I'm holding up my little sort of like, you know, constantly used sample toy, this little yellow truck. Uh, visual regard is not directly looking at something, but, but it's still looking and it's still observable. So visual regard may look like this, right? Looking almost past or through something. That sort of classic textbook CVI visual behavior that we see. That's regard, that's not fixation. Eye to object fixation is looking directly at something. It can be turning your whole head toward it and looking, or it can be looking you know, from the side, but definitely directly with central vision, in your central vision. And if you are only making visual regard, you can try it yourself, hold up an object and only look at something with visual regard. It looks blurred. You don't get a lot of the details of it. If it's a complex or multi-patterned or multi-colored target, you're going to get a lot less information as opposed to if it's a solid, bright, and less complex target, right? So um, if you're making eye to object contact, suddenly you can see all the details and you can start to pick apart things based on their unique individual and salient features. In early phase two, we don't have that. In later phase two, we do. And eye to object contact, tends to start roughly around four to five on the CVI range. And it's a good gauge for figuring out what kinds of adaptations we should make. The question in phase two that we should be asking ourselves is what needs to be visually adapted in order to elicit and sustain the child's visual attention at targeted points in a routine, in every routine. Um, there are some planning tools and approaches such as the CVI schedule for doing that. And I'm gonna share some examples with you. So phase two intervention is all about planning the vision component of routines. One easy way to think about it from, from my perspective or experience is picking something in the beginning 
something in the middle and something at the end of every routine that you want to adapt. And for a student who's a little higher up on the range, there may be more than three things, but starting with roughly three things in every activity. Using objects from phase one to support vision. So in phase one, it's just about looking for the sake of looking, right? And we're just looking at, at materials that are bright, shiny, interesting, and moving. In phase two, we're using those same types of materials and adaptations in the context of real functional routines throughout the child's day. So here's a, an example of beginning, middle, end adapting. Um, and this is a morning arrival routine. And this is something as you know, the CVI point person or TVI sometimes, you could help the classroom teacher to develop. So what are you expecting? Think about like a task analysis, uh, breaking down the steps of this routine. It's about finding the classroom first, then it's about once you find the classroom and go into the door of the classroom, finding your locker, putting your stuff in the locker. And then the routine roughly ends when you sit down in your chair and you're ready for you know, the next activity. So can we pick one thing in each of those parts, components of that routine that's going to be visually adapted? And the goal is that the child is going to visually engage with that adaptation. And I want to emphasize that second point because often I see people making the adaptations, but then not really bothering to see if the child actually uses the adaptations or looks at them. It's important that we take the time and that we allow for visual processing. We even add, um, maybe add another component like shining a flashlight on it or moving it. We want to take as much time as we need in order to make sure that those visual adaptations are looked at and engaged with visually. So at the beginning, we're just gonna have a little red tape around the door tag of the classroom. In the middle, we're gonna have the name in large print with the color bubbling around it on cardstock, like that's the child's you know, label. And same thing on the chair at the end of the activity. Pretty straightforward. Phase two intervention ideas in phase, in session one, when we talked about visual complexity, we saw some examples of children looking away or, you know, even light gazing during mealtime routines because it was just too complex of an activity to deal with eating, focusing on eating, swallowing for children who, who have, um, you know, low muscle tone and um, for whom that's a really strenuous task. Um, but would the child be able to use their vision if we just made a little adaptation to it? So it's not about necessarily like the spoon itself has to be a bright color. It could just be any sort of target, a target at the end of the spoon, something bigger and brighter. Um, because the goal here is not that the child looks at the spoon. The goal is that the child uses his vision in that activity, uses his vision simultaneous to eating. So that's one way to think about it, just creating a target. Or it could be that the object itself is adapted, like um, finding your toothbrush in the, you know, in the bowl or in the, you know, in the in the cup or jar that you have by the sink, um, because it's a bright color, right? And then also think about the array of other, if there are other things, if other toothbrushes in the same cup holder, um, it's going to be more complex. Do we need to take those out, or is it okay to leave them there if we just have that brightly colored one? It could be that the bowl during mealtime is going to be brighter color or the placemat even, or um, we're going to have like a name tag or a visual landmark to be able to direct the child's attention. Okay. Um, and when I was a classroom teacher, I had a student with CVI in phase two who really did not like to wear her shoes in the classroom. She had some um, sensitivity issues in her feet and she really needed to take her shoes off. Um, and so we all agreed, well, sure, you can take your shoes off, but in the classroom, but you have to put them in a basket. You got to put them somewhere. And then when you're ready to leave the classroom, you have to go with us and get them, retrieve them from that place. And we're going to use your vision to do that. So we very simply just got a bright yellow bucket that she had to put her shoes in. Um, she put up a pretty decent fight for the first few weeks. And then um, once she got the routine down, it was totally a natural and independent part of her routine and really way more functional than just taking your shoe off and throwing it over your shoulders, which is what she was doing before. Um, same sort of idea in a communication and functional context where the student is using sort of like a picture exchange communication system. We'll talk about that 
in much greater detail when we talk about um, AAC um, and what kinds of symbols might be appropriate. But this was a good example of the finished box being just a nice, small, contained, bright red, you know, bucket or basket that the um, child could put the cue that she was finished with in. Very simple idea of the student helping the student to find their locker at the beginning of the day or, you know, when they needed to get stuff from their cubby by just getting a, a yellow piece of a strip of yellow electrical tape um, and just lining the locker with it. You don't need to necessarily do the full outline. It was just enough for this student to line the bottom of it um, in an otherwise very busy and multi-sensory complex area, right? Um, also, they put, I don't know if you can see it that well, but on her hook where she hangs her jacket, there's also yellow tape wrapped around it. We could probably make that even brighter. Um, we could probably have it be a little, stand out a little bit more too. Great. So, um, in phase two, we might also start to see a use of the light box that's much more functional as opposed to in phase one, it's really just looking at stuff, right? For the sake of looking at interesting things. In phase two, we don't need to do those types of just looking at you know, bright colored things on the light box, looking at the swirly mat. That's a phase one uh, intervention. In phase two, we start to use the light box for more functional activities like early literacy, introducing letters, introducing images or shapes, um, sorting, classifying. And, uh, and it, it just wanna get into the habit of thinking about phase one intervention doesn't feel very functional because it's not, right? It's just looking for the sake of looking. Phase two intervention must have a function. There must be a reason for what we're doing that's not just looking for the sake of looking. That's a good thing to remind yourself of when you're working with kids in phase two. Um, I showed this example in part one, but I like to show it again. Um, I won't take a lot of time, but just a little bit of red tape uh, around the light switch to be able to look, find the light switch as a landmark, a visual landmark, like an orientation mobility, from a little bit further away. The child may not need that adaptation when they're right in front of the light switch, but when they're maybe three, four, five, six feet away from it, depending on the child and their use of distance vision and their use of complexity, um, it may be that extra bright color really, really helps to direct their visual attention to that landmark at a distance and start to build some predictability in orienting to their environment. Um, very similar idea um, to this and to the locker uh, example. This was in an older uh, classroom, uh, sort of transition age students who were in a pre-vocational classroom um, in upstate New York. And it was one of the classroom's um, school jobs to pass out and, and sell snacks to the rest of the school. So the student with CVI, he didn't need, this is, you can see the shelf with the popcorn on different, um, on different shelves. And you can see on the top shelf, there's a bright yellow outline made of cardstock, like, you know, bright yellow cardstock in a full rectangle around the top shelf. He didn't need that when he was right in front of it, but from across the classroom, it's exactly what he needed to direct his visual attention to be able to independently wheel himself in his wheelchair over to that area and get the, um, get the things he was looking for. Uh, think about a busy, um, high school or, you know, think about any busy um, hallway and how different a child's experience is in the hallway when there are lots of other people in the hallway versus when there is no one in the hallway versus when there's somebody in the hallway walking in front of them with a bright, easy target to follow. So this is one way that we can start to think about adapting orientation mobility routines for students or transitions from classroom to classroom or from activity to activity that take them into the hallway. Can we plan it at times of day when, our, when it's not quite so insane and busy? And can we also use these sort of natural, um, you know, un almost like universal design adaptations that work for everyone, but really are critical for the child with CVI to be able to use their vision actively in that activity. And, you know, I just, uh, I would be interested to hear your, your examples of how that actually fits into your own um, student's day and activities too, and ways that you can build these things in naturally so that they're not just totally, um, you know, contrived. Um, lots and lots and lots of good examples on paths to literacy, of course, um, and kudos to Charlotte again. 
Um, this is a, one that I like to share just as a good example um, from Rachel Bennett, who is a parent of a child with CVI and also now is um, the, uh, I guess the content coordinator of Perkins eLearning's uh, CVI Now website, um, which is worth checking out. Um, and Rachel Bennett has really great examples, really concrete examples of mostly these are phase two, what you see on Paths to Literacy that she's posted, phase two adaptations for her son. Um, and she explains them and then she gives you um, a really good image, which to me is way better than, you know, looking on Pinterest or on, um, you know, Google images. So you can see um, some pretty concrete phase two adaptations, don't really need to go through each of them here. Um, another good phase two intervention, just reaching to get it on the shelf here, is to, um, I had a much better one in my office, which I can't get into, um, but so I just made a sort of a DIY one out of cardboard and a Sharpie, um, but to make like a window or an occluder to be able to show a student um, almost like you, almost like a partner assisted scanning or visual modeling practice to be able to show them what to look at. Um, in a really unintrusive way, rather than taking the child's hand and showing them or, um, or pointing even, which isn't that effective visually, it's not a great visual strategy for a child with CBI to follow. This is much, much better, um, where you can show you on a book too. So, um, you know, take a, take a children's book, you wanna show a child a pretty busy children's book and you wanna direct their attention toward a specific target on it. Can we find the blue balloon here? Can you touch it? Notice that this is cut out so that the child can actually touch, touch it. Um, the yellow balloon and so on, right? We're using a window, a bright colored occluder, which has a color adaptation as well as a complexity adaptation to reduce the overwhelming complexity of a visual array. Cool, and really good comments there too. Yeah, and, and note, as Laura is saying there, hi, Laura, good to see you here. As Laura Elmer is saying here, that um, there's a difference too between this type of red occluder that doesn't have a big boundary around it, as opposed to a, um, you know, an actual full black occluder, which I'm sure I have somewhere in this bag, um, which would block out all of the extra space, right? Ah, it's somewhere in there. Um, a black occluder, you know, would be actually just creating a window with a blocking out all of the extra content. Also for another child, it may be equally or more helpful to, um, to use just like a, a brightly colored pointer or highlighter. Um, if you're not seeing, oh, if you're not seeing comments, uh, make sure that you address them to panelists and attendees rather than to just panelists. Okay, so again, accommodations for phase two, I'm not going to go through them all, but they're here for you if you want to, um, if you want to kind of take this as a starting point for thinking about how these things actually fit into an IEP under um, mandated accommodations management needs. I just want to make a really quick point about smart boards. Smart boards in general are not effective for viewing directly by students with CVI. I mean, may vary from child to child, but smart boards are sort of big and complex and overwhelming. And if they're the older smart boards, they're not backlit, they're frontlit with a projector, which is, makes them very hazy. And that's why you need to turn the light in the room off in order to look at them um, because they're hazy, they're not backlit, and they're really not bright or illuminated. Um, also, the size of a smart board doesn't actually help. It just adds to the complexity. Screen quality varies and so on. So the general recommendation that I'll pretty much across the board make for a child with CVI, if there's any expectation that they're going to get information visually from the smart board, is to connect to the smart board via an iPad mirroring app or a tablet mirroring app. Um, some examples are Join Me or iMirror. They're, they're always changing which ones are free and which ones aren't. Um, but this is the idea that instead of going up to the smart board or dealing with this big complex array, we have a much more contained space on our desk and we can um, account for all of the background complexity and we can engage with it directly. And um, if you need to, you can set up the Zoom feature on it as well. In fact, I think Join Me, I'm not sure about the others, actually allows you to, um, to zoom in on different sections and to take screenshots and so on. 
Um, but mirroring our smart board is a much, much better idea in general um, than trying to find a way to access it or adapt it uh, in, in person. Yeah, good, good point. Um, Diana is saying, um, yeah, remote learning, each student having their own screen has actually been much more helpful. Um, and I should point out, we could do like a whole separate session on um, use of remote platforms for distance learning. Fortunately, myself and the TVI colleague who I mentioned before, Jonathan Hooper and Dr. Roman uh, did a two part webinar series on that topic um, for Perkins eLearning. Um, you can just, I can find the link for you in a bit, but um, we also developed a, a, um, a set of guidelines and resources for supporting adaptations to remote instruction, including like built-in features on Zoom, using the annotate feature to draw on top of things and whatnot. Uh, how can you recreate that when you return in person, just pass around an iPad? No, I think you really need your student to have their own individual device and um, if necessary to get an, an assistive technology evaluation to determine the child's need for the device. But um, you really want it to be something the child has sort of consistent access to. And if the child is using an iPad as a communication device, you really need a second one to be able to connect with the smart board, right? Uh, you can get a copy of the slides, definitely. Um, Ruthann has the PDF of the PowerPoint as well as um, any tools and resources that I share with you. Uh, yeah, all of your students who need an iPad should have one, not necessarily all of your students. Oh, thank you, Charlotte, put the um, link for the distance learning series. Um, here's an example of planning an individual activity, intervention for an individual activity. Um, this is a hand washing routine, right? Seems appropriate during current times to focus on hand washing. So same thing as we talked about before with arrival to the classroom, we need to pick, we almost break down the steps of the activity like a task analysis, if anyone had to do that in you know, school. And you wanna find a couple of things to adapt throughout the activity. And this, I like this example because um, it's thoughtful to what a child with CVI in phase two may actually be able to look at, which are the less complex components of this activity. So if you think about hand washing, you can kind of break it down into these rough steps, locate and find the bathroom, find the sink, turn on the water, wet your hands, get the soap, apply the soap, lather the soap, rally your hands, rinse your hands, find the towel and dry your hands. Now, the ones that involve a lot of doing, a lot of multi-sensory doing are not gonna be as easy to use vision in, right? So actually, washing your hands when the water's hitting your hands there's a lot of multi-sensory input happening it may be okay for the child to look away at that time so instead and maybe even drying the towel or lathering hands that's a multi-sensory activity but just finding materials that may be the targeted uh, point for your child um, individually right so it may be just finding having a little bit of a tape or mylar around the edge of the bathroom find the bathroom, a bright green color for the soap dispenser, a bright yellow towel, right? Very simple, but giving the child opportunities to access those materials um, and taking the time to make sure that they do is going to give them that practice that they need to actually make improvements in their vision over time. There are some examples, I'm not gonna go through them all, but examples of a CVI schedule, which is, um, taking, making those types of adaptations throughout the entire day. So it's really critically important. Probably the biggest piece of advice I'd give you on a CVI schedule is don't make it overwhelming. Overwhelming plans do not get implemented. Make it concise and make it deliberate and make sure that every single person on the team who would be engaged in activities with the student is part of the actual process of creating this schedule because otherwise those people are not gonna have any buy-in. If you just create a schedule for them as a TVI and say, here, do this, they don't have any buy-in and you probably are gonna be missing some of the functional opportunities and some of the opportunities that are really tied towards those individual disciplines goals, right? You need the OT to help you figure out what adaptations happen in OT. You need the teacher to help you figure out what adaptations happen in literacy or in morning circle, right? 
And uh, roughly you're looking at the activity, the way that the characteristics or which characteristics most impact that activity, and then um, just some concrete adaptations. Um, question, if you have students who are deafblind, they can actually go through I Can Connect to request an iPad. Yeah, thank you so much for pointing that out, Lisa. Um, I Can Connect through the Helen Keller National Center, um, or ICC, um, provides free iPads to students who have combined vision and hearing loss. Um, if they can demonstrate, if you can demonstrate that they could benefit from it in terms of their communication. Doesn't have to be AAC, but any level of communication. Um, yeah, and I'll definitely get you a copy of the slides. Just on the um, on the slides, you can see some you know more comprehensive examples of um, of a phase three CVI schedule. Um, also, just a very quick little activity planning tool that I made to help teams um, break this down. Pick any activity or any routine, and this is your sort of um, talking talking point for. Um, creating those adaptations, break down the routine steps, talk about what CVI characteristics are most impacted, and then what are you gonna to do to adapt those? Pretty straightforward. Suggestions for the role of the TVI in phase two, probably more a combination of push in and pull out, right? Because you may need to do some more sort of, you know, intensive vision work in a quieter zone, but you really should be doing at least some degree of push in in phase two, because phase two is all about um, integrating vision and function throughout the day. So if you're not there with them and understanding what their day actually looks like from a functional perspective, you may be missing the boat. Um, okay, so I wanna spend a little bit of time on phase three. We only have 10 minutes. This is always what happens to phase three, um, which is I think okay because phase three is almost its own entire thing that we need a whole separate session for. Um, but I wanna give you some of the basic points. Um, and some of the real, um, you know, emphasis for phase three. The goal in phase three is refinement of the CVI characteristics. We, I used to say that the goal in phase three was um, using vision for learning or something like that, but I think really using vision for learning is the goal of every phase. The goal in phase three is targeting those characteristics and thinking about how um, the child can sort of adapt to their use of vision throughout the day, regardless of the impact of each of those characteristics. Kids in phase three are demonstrating visual curiosity. That means that they're looking around. It's sort of like the ocular skill of scanning, of visually scanning the environment, but it's about more, more than that, it's about consistent use of vision throughout the day. Um, you know, they really are looking around and using their vision. They're not doing as much, if any, you know, really so, sort of like not engaged, not looking, staring off or light gazing. Students in phase three can process 2D information. That doesn't mean that they know what it means. That doesn't mean that they can identify, recognize, or discriminate it, but they can neurologically process it. So that means that they have the readiness to do those deeper, higher order processing skills, which very often is the, is the activity and the intervention of phase three. They need adaptations to support learning and visual vocabulary. Um, phase two, we should be talking about salient features as well, but in phase three, it's really sort of becomes the um, one of the most important components of CVI intervention. And if you haven't heard that term, salient features are the unique or specific parts of anything, 2D or 3D of an object or a target that make it unique, that make it what it is, that make it identifiable or recognizable. I like to give the example, we'll talk about this in the AAC session more too, of um, these PEC symbols, right? Mayor Johnson or board maker uh, line drawings. These are about as bad as you can get in terms of two symbols that um, really look pretty much the same, right? What are the unique features or the defining features that we can look at if we have vision and we don't have CVI, that we can look at these symbols and identify that they are actually in fact different. So let's start by emphasizing those differences. Let's start by using colors, just like we did in phase two. Now we're using colors to support visual vocabulary, to support the child understanding what they're looking at and making sense of those critical components or salient features. So maybe we're talking about highlighting the component with a color. Uh, if we're not focusing on looking at the words too, we probably wanna reduce the complexity and take away those words. 
or if we are using the words, then we probably don't need the images at all. And we probably really instead are focusing on the visual features of the words themselves as sight words. And that's the practice of sight word bubbling, which I'll share with you really briefly um, with recognizing we have about eight minutes left. Um, I like to point out that a lot of what we think of as phase three interventions are really part of what we usually talk about as universal design. Um, this is a picture on the left of um, the subway entrance in New York City. You can see that from you know, 50 feet away, if you have um, decent refractive vision, you can see that that's the one train. And you know it's the one train because you recognize that bright red circle that represents the one train. You may not be able to visually discriminate the one at 50 feet away, but you can recognize it as the one based on that bright red because each subway line has a different color. Um, at even further away, you could probably recognize the bright green subway lamp that's outside of the subway. A lot of these things are just helpful for anyone. The use of bright saturated colors to, to highlight important information that tells us what it is that we're looking at. For kids in phase three, it's critical to their understanding and their processing of information. We may again use things like occluders and windows as well to be able to even just highlight what it is that we're looking at, um, even if that thing is a little more complex in its detail. Um, this is important in phase two as well. Um, it really just depends on if the child has eye to object contact, has 2D recognition. Um, this is probably the most important thing to talk about in phase three in salient feature instruction. And the analogy or example that I'll give is that um, CVI is like a Google image bank that doesn't have very many images in it. A child with CVI searches a term in their head or looks at a new uh, visual target, looks at a picture, looks at an object that they don't recognize. And it's almost like the search comes up with no images. They're doing a visual search in their brain and it comes up with no images and they can't match it to what it is that they're looking at. Whereas we, if we don't have CVI, we search a term and we get thousands of images. We have so many images in our head of different things that we can even recognize them when we're presented with an odd or different version of them. So this is what it looks like the first handful of images when you search, uh, when you do a Google image search for a bear. And I like this example because I showed a child with CVI in phase three pictures of different animals, uh, including a bear. And when I showed them one of these pictures of a bear, the child said, to identify what it was, the child said, oh, that's a dog. Okay, well, when the child searched for that image and tried to match it with other images in his own Google image bank, the closest that he could come up with was dog. And if you think about it, it makes pretty obvious sense why he came up with dog. Uh, dogs have actually similar shaped snouts to bears. They have four legs. If you look at the top left picture or the bottom left picture too, or the top right picture, or legs, brown, furry sort of texture that you can glean from it. There's nothing that we get about size from looking at pictures. If you're not in front of a real object, size is not really a helpful salient feature. So when that child searched for that image, the best that he could come up with was dog. And it was pretty close because when you search for dog, you get some pretty similar features, right? You get that same shaped snout, the little small eyes, you get the brown fur, you get four legs, of course, dogs, there's many different kinds of dogs. So that makes it even harder to recognize each individual one and to categorize it based on its term. So what do we wanna do in phase three? We wanna take an image, take an iconic image. This is the bear that we're gonna to use to start to teach bear. It's not the only one, we could use many images. We're gonna use this one because it's a pretty good iconic image. We're gonna take away all of the unnecessary background information. We don't need all of that green stuff. That's nothing about what um, contextualizes this as a bear. And actually, since it's a bright color, it's probably just distracting and makes it harder to focus on the bear, the bear's qualities. So once we got our image, now we're gonna find a unique salient visual feature. In this case, we're using the bear's ears because it's a pretty good salient feature, this sort of rounded triangle a shape, a little half circle almost um, that we can find on the bear's ears. And we're really pointing them out. So we're highlighting it with a bright color or a saturated color. And we're really pointing it out to the child. This is a bear. We know it's a bear, first of all, because it's got these ears and the ears are shaped like this. They're a round half circle. 
<laughs> and we're making sure that we take the time to point that out visually to the child, give them time to look at it, have them restate it if they can. And now once we've found that, we can look at any number of pictures of bears and we can find those ears. And we can do the same thing on pictures of, of actual bears, photos of bears, cartoons of bears, even a teddy bear. Um, all of them have that same iconic shape of ear. And that's a good first salient feature. We wanna think of hopefully two or hopefully even three salient features that make each thing unique. And we don't want to use them all at the same time. We want to use them individually to point out those features so that when the child sees something new, never seen this one on the top left before, what do you think it might be? Is that a dog? I don't think it's a dog. And we know it's not a dog because it doesn't have the features that we've set up for identifying a dog. We know it's a bear because it has these ears, right? Um, just another minute left, I wanna show you this really quick example because um, people always like examples of using technology in interesting ways. This was a parent um, example, a child with CVI in early phase three, late phase two, early phase three. And the mom wanted to show her daughter um, pictures, photos of their family's trip to the beach, right? And she didn't wanna take away the background and say, you know, create this stale image of, you know, it's not even possible to adapt this picture in a way that makes it still a functional family photo. Instead, she wanted to take something and adapt it in a way that her child could actually engage with the, the real photo. <laughs> so she found this um, like dollar, again, dollar, dollar 99 app called Explain Everything. And it allows you to record audio and as well as animate on top of a, pic on top of a photograph. So it could actually create like an entire album on an iPad or iPhone or whatever um, of adapted images. And you can hear, I'll play it for you very quickly and then I'll try to wrap it up. So she's saying, this is Leia at the beach. Her feet are in the water. Her hands are touching the water. The beach is behind her and the water is in front of her with the waves. <clears throat> this is Leia at the beach. Her feet are in the water and her hands are touching the water. You can see the beach along here and the water right here. Okay. Very simple, it took 20 seconds for her to make um, and starting to create an actual album of these types of photos to be able to watch these videos over and over again. And it's good to have them recorded because it's a consistent presentation as opposed to doing these things in person, we may vary our use of adaptations and even our use of language. So um, nice example. Um, I just wanna show you what else is on this PowerPoint. It's called Explain Everything. There is a link to the Salient Features Collaborative. This is a website set up by Matt Tejan um, for his class through Perkins eLearning. And it gives you actual examples of sa suggested salient features. I think they have like a hundred examples on this at this point. And when you click on an example, it gives you actual adapted images that you might wanna use. The link is up there at the top. There's also um, some examples of salient feature scripts. So you could say, you know, this is a cat. See, it has whiskers that come out in lines from the side of its face, a pointy ears on the top of its head and this long tail. It's different from a dog, which has a snout shaped like this, and you can show the shape. These four paws shaped like this, the long straight legs, the pointy tail. Now let's look at some more pictures of cats. Can you find the long straight whiskers on the side of the face? Can you find the short pointy ears and the long tail? And we're gonna look at almost like this complexity sequence, which is what Matt Tejan talks about a lot in his what's the complexity framework of looking at how images themselves build up in layers of visual as well as conceptual complexity. Same approach you're using to point out landmarks, signs, words, letters, everything. Um, these are examples, another one that my colleague Jonathan shared with me of actual salient feature dictionaries. So I'm not gonna go through this because we're really out of time, but I wanted to make sure that these were here for you on the slides, um, breaking down that concept of recognition, identification, discrimination, it's like we could spend a lot of time on this, some of the tools and resources that are available for doing this, some examples on landmarks, 
previewing routes. Again, I'm just skimming now. Um, the link to bubbling sightwords, so you don't have to do that by hand or yourself. Um, there's a really great uh, free URL application for bubbling sightwords. Um, the best program or website for moving backgrounds from pictures? I've heard different um, answers to that question. Uh, there is an application just called Remove Background or something like that. I think it's free um, that does that. You can also do it really, really easily on PowerPoint. And if you go to the um, Distance Learning Considerations website, uh, Distance Learning Considerations webinar rather that um, Charlotte posted uh, in the chat box earlier, uh, Jonathan actually walks you through how to, a tutorial of how to remove the background of images on PowerPoint. Uh, myriad examples here for you of what this actually looks like in practice for teaching sight words. And um, to go back a little bit, PCVIS, Pediatric Cortical Visual Impairment Society, from my point of view, really has the best explanations of how to do these things. So those are there for you just as resources. And, you know, my suggestions are there as well. And then we're really just kind of wrapping up from there. More and more and more examples and resources at the end. And um, here's my final little animation for you. So um, I'm happy to, I know we're out of time um, and, and I, I wanna be respectful to for your time as well as to the captioner, of course, but I'm happy to stay on for um, any questions if anybody has any. Okay, and what we're gonna do now is I'm gonna do a quick poll, which is going to give us some feedback on how you felt about this session. And then I'll give the closing code for ACV REP credit. So here's the poll. You can please complete it really quickly. Just, I think it's just two questions on a scale of one to five. How helpful did you find the webinar? And the second question, will you use what you learned today in your practice? And I was looking, um, February 17th is the next webinar. Someone yeah. asked that in February 17th and put it in the chat box is um, CVI and communication. Great, okay. All right, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna end the poll and the closing code for today's webinar is phases. P H A S E S phases. Chris, you're the best presenter of CVI materials. Thank you, Sherry. I'm I'm absolutely moved. Thank you. Um, and to get your ACVREP credits, I did put this in the chat earlier, but you do need to send your opening and closing codes to Alan Kaufman, and his email is Alan A L A N dot Kaufman, K A U F M A N at pgcps.org. And I'll put that in the chat again. Okay, I'm gonna end the poll. Got it, uh, Ruthann, pgcps.org. That's right, oh, thank you so much. No problem. So overwhelmingly, everyone thought this is extremely helpful and 100% or almost 100% said they will use it in their practice. So way to go, Chris. <laughs> Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And I, I put my own uh, email into the chat box as well. You're more than welcome to reach out to me. I always say this um, sort of at risk of getting a thousand emails, but if I do, then so be it. Um, I'd love to hear from you and I'm happy to share resources, examples. If there was something in here you saw, but you wanted to see the full example of the, of the adaptation, um, usually I can share that with you as long as I can get you know permission from the person who created the adaptation. Um, I also just added in somebody asked the question um can you repeat the name of for the organization for free ipads for children who are deafblind it's called i can connect i lowercase i as we do with technology now can connect okay and yes um you send the codes to alan kaufman and the again the closing code is phases p-h-a-s-e-s -E and um if you did not get the PowerPoint and the materials today, I sent earlier my email or Conchita Hernandez's email. You can uh, send an email to us to request them and we'll forward them to you. Okay, uh, Chris, we'll see you on February 17th. Thank you again.
for an awesome presentation. Thank you so much again. Thanks, um, Ruth Ann, and thank you to Conchita as well. All right. Take care. See you all next month.